Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of In The Miso Soup by Ryu Murakami. Dane reads. So this was recommended to me by my good friend Robert Honor. I know him through, there's a Facebook group called Open Mic Slate, which is like a virtual open mic for pandemic -y times when uh, obviously real open mics can't take place. I also chatted to him for my radio show, The Art Show, and he mentioned this is the book he'd most recently read and recommended it to me. So I thought I'd go ahead and check it out because I'd heard good things. And as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So. It's just before New Year and Frank, an overweight American tourist, has hired Kenji to take him on a guided tour of Tokyo's nightlife. But Frank's behaviour is so odd that Kenji begins to entertain a horrible suspicion. His client may in fact have murderous desires. Although Kenji is far from innocent himself, he unwillingly descends with Frank into an inferno of evil from which only his 16-year-old girlfriend Jun can possibly save him. And on the front we have a quote from The Guardian, reads like the script notes for American Psycho, The Holiday Abroad. I can kind of see that, but I also preferred this to American Psycho. A little spoiler for you there. So let's go and check out some tap. And so kind of setting the scene here. The New Year's holiday was nearly upon us, but Kabuki Cho was as busy as ever. A decade ago, the sex industry catered mainly to middle-aged men, but now there are lots of young customers too. It seems that more and more young dudes can't be bothered to look for a girlfriend or a fuck buddy. Overseas, these guys would probably turn gay, but Japan has the sex industry. I don't think sexuality actually works like that, but you know. And again, this is uh, a little bit of foreshadowing for what comes later. I found a tout I knew and had him guide us to his pub. Satoshi was the same age as me, 20. At 18 he'd come to Tokyo from Yamanashi, or Nagano, I forget which, to attend a college prep school, and almost immediately went mental. I didn't know him then, but he once showed me a souvenir of those times. He invited me to his apartment in the wee hours one morning and pulled out a set of children's building blocks. It seems he used to ride around and around on the Yamanote line with them, building castles on the floor of the train. Why would you do that? I asked him, and he shrugged. I don't know man, I found them at Kiddyland and I just wanted to buy them and play with them somewhere, you know. And then I thought the train would be good, and it was good man. It's fun trying to build a castle on a moving train. You can like lose yourself or whatever and not have all these weird thoughts. Because at the time I kept having this weird thought about poking some little girl's eyes with a pin or a toothpick or a hypodermic needle. Something pointy like that. And it scared me to think about what if I really did it. But once I started playing with my blocks on the floor of the train, I forgot about that obsession or compulsion or whatever you call it. Because it's not easy to stack blocks on the floor of a moving train, you really need to concentrate, and the Yamanote line has some major curves, like between Harajuku and Yoyogi especially, and I had to cradle the little castle in my arms to keep it from falling apart. Sure, I got yelled at, man. I don't know how many times conductors and station workers yelled at me, and I was even picked up by the railway cops a few times, but hell, it's not like I was doing it during rush hour. Anyway, this went on for about six months, but then when I came to Kabukicho, it cured me. Hey, I wouldn't say I love Kabukicho, I mean, I doubt if anybody loves it. But it's an amazingly easy place to be. And who's going to think about sticking needles in little girls' eyes when they're working in a town they like and have a chance to go to the university of their choice? Yeah, that's why I moved to London, mate. And um, I just want to read this little bit out. There's a little reference to Kawaii as well, which is very cute. Okay, so he extracted Tokyo Pink Eyed, the book this time, from his bag. The way of sexual liberation, shouted a blurb on the cover above the title. Translation, this book will make you horny and show you what to do about it. Below the title it said what, where and how much. All the information you need to navigate Tokyo's sexiest spots. I have a copy of this book for business purposes and I'm slowly wading through it, partly to brush up my English, but I have to admit it's pretty interesting. For example, chapter 9 is about the gay scene. It starts with historical background, how the Buddhist prohibitions against women and the machismo of samurai society gave rise to a love of boys, and goes up to the present, taking care to explain that even though the entire sex industry in Japan has developed xenophobia because of AIDS, gays from more enlightened countries are still given a warm welcome in Shinjuki Nichon. It even names the best clubs to visit if you happen to be foreign. Frank opened the bright pink book and looked from Raika to Rai, saying, All right then, here goes. In the back of the book was a simple Japanese-English sex glossary, and he began reading words in alphabetical order. Aho, he said in a booming voice, and gave us the English translation, shithead. What did he just say? Rhi asked me, not quite understanding his accent. When I repeated the word, she began laughing and slapping her knee, saying, Ayuda, kawaii! I can't stand it, how cute. I'm sorry for my Japanese, I don't speak any Japanese. Alright, and then they're talking about homeless people, and uh, I'll just read this out. Why doesn't someone chase him out of here? Too much trouble. I saw a lot of homeless in the park too, and in the station. I didn't realise there were so many in Japan. Are there kids here who rough them up? Yeah, there are, I said, thinking, doesn't this clown realise how cold it is? I bet there are. So what do you think of kids who do such a thing, Kenji? Stuff like that is going to happen, I guess. They smell bad for one thing. It's hard to imagine wanting to get close and be nice to them. 
The smell, yeah? That's true, smell is definitely a factor in deciding who we like and don't like. New York has street gangs that specialise in molesting vagrants. No money in it, of course, they just take pleasure in the violence, pulling a homeless fellow's teeth out one by one with pliers, for example, or even assaulting them sexually. Getting a little bit of foreshadowing. I just thought this was interesting, especially as someone who I grew up with um, parents who are divorced and I suffer from anxiety disorder. John's parents divorced when she was small, so she knows what it's like to be anxious or scared and want to be with somebody but not have to talk. I think people like John and me are becoming the mainstream in this country. Very few people of our generation or the next will reach adulthood without experiencing the sort of unhappiness you can't really deal with on your own. We're still in the minority, so the media lump us together as the oversensitive young, or whatever the latest catchphrase is, but eventually that will change. Yeah, snowflake, generation snowflakers. And Frank has this ability to kind of hypnotize people and he's doing it here. And um, this is what our, our main character is doing while he does that. I was on Frank's right and Noriko was across from us. Frank had pushed up the sleeves of his sweater and jacket. And from where I sat, I had a clear view of his left wrist and the back of his right hand. There wasn't much hair on the inside of his left wrist. And I could see that he'd applied makeup there like a flesh colored foundation. What was he covering up, I wondered. Frank was recounting the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, and as I translated for Noriko, I peered at his wrist. Beneath the makeup, I could see these raised lines that at first I thought were a particular sort of tattoo, like Hell's Angels often give themselves, scraping the skin to make a swollen wound and then injecting ink. When I realised what they really were, every hair on my body stood on end. Suicide scars. I know a girl who has three scars like that on her left wrist, but Frank's scars were beyond belief. There were dozens of them, more than you could count, within a space of about two centimetres, and they went halfway around his wrist. How many times had that wrist been slashed then allowed to heal, only to be slashed again? Just thinking about it made me feel like throwing up. And then we get um, somebody singing karaoke and we have this. The last thing I needed right now was to have someone belt out at ear-splitting ear volume, a song I didn't even like. People in this country have no consideration for others, no glimmer of comprehension that they might be annoying those around them. There was something very ugly about this man contorting his face as he struggled with the high notes. It wasn't a good key for him, and in any case it wasn't a song he'd chosen out of an actual desire to sing it. He'd chosen it to ingratiate himself with the girls, and he didn't seem to notice that the girls were all but yawning and rolling their eyes. In other words, he was the only one who failed to realise that what he was doing was completely useless and infuriating. I was getting genuinely pissed off and beginning to wonder if we really needed people like this in the world. For a moment I thought, he should be put to death this guy. And at that very moment, Frank looked at me and nodded and smiled as if to say, exactly. An electric shiver ran through me. And it was around about this point, that com combined with the suicide scars, that I formed a theory that Frank uh, doesn't exist. He's just a figment of our main character's imagination. You will have to read the book to see whether that theory is correct or not. We get a reference to some expensive tofu that I would definitely try. I couldn't believe it at first. They had tofu made by hand somewhere near Mount Fuji that they can only make five blocks of it a day. And it was 500 yen for one piece. I don't know how much that is in British pounds. All right, and then here's where we start to get to some real gruesome scenes, which I enjoyed. My, my friend Robert, who told me to read this, he was like, don't read it before bed. And I'm like, is this why? Because, I don't know, maybe I'm just desensitized after so much horror and stuff, but I don't know, it's, I find reading is a lot less intense than like watching a movie. So if I watched a gruesome horror movie, it'd give me the heebie-jeebies. But when I read a gruesome book, I don't mind so much. So I'm gonna read this full paragraph. All right, Kenji, come on back in, Frank said. I didn't want to go, but with Frank's eyes drilling into me, I couldn't have moved anyway. I had turned to stone from the tip of each hair on my head all the way down to my toenails. Frank grabbed me by the shoulder and dragged me inside. At the door I lost my balance and nearly fell, but he caught me and easily supported my entire weight with his right arm. He carried me inside as if I were a piece of luggage and dropped me carelessly on the floor. I heard him walk back to the door and pull down the steel security shutter outside it. When I opened my eyes I saw two pairs of legs, a man's and a woman's. I knew the woman was Mackie by her red high heels and white lace stockings. A wet, shiny scarlet line slithered down the shin of one stocking. Like a living creature, some sort of parasite maybe, it was crawling along the delicate threads at a slow but steady pace. At a table facing her, Lady Number 5 along with Mr Children and Lady Number 3 sat goggling slack-jawed at Mackie. The moment I looked up and saw what they were staring at, everything in my stomach began the journey back up my esophagus. It looked as though Mackie had another mouth below her jaw. Oozing from the second smiling mouth was a thick dark liquid like coal tar. Her throat had been slit literally from ear to ear and more than halfway through, so that it looked as if her head might fall right off. And yet, incredibly, Mackie was still on her feet and still alive, her eyeballs swivelling wildly and her lips quivering as she wheezed foam-flecked blood from the wound in her throat. She seemed to be trying to say something. The man beside her was the manager. 
He and Maki were leaning against each other as if they'd been positioned to hold each other up. His neck was twisted in an unnatural way, his head turned as though to look over his shoulder, but drooping limply, chin resting on his shoulder blade. Just beyond Maki's high heels, Yuko and the waiter lay in a heap on the floor. A thin blade, like a sashimi knife, was buried deep in Yuko's lower back, and the waiter's neck was twisted like the manager's. And I'm just going to read this as well, this is fa fairly disturbing. <laughs> Alright, Kenji, Frank said, you don't have to have sex with her, but how about picking up that ear and sticking it in her pussy? You can do that much, can't you? He said this quietly, sounding almost despondent now. Ever crammed an ear into a pussy before, he asked me. I didn't answer. His face was expressionless as he put the knife down on the sofa, plucked the dust-covered ear off the floor, folded it, and tried to insert it into Lady Number no. 5's vagina. He didn't seem to realise she was wearing a tampon. He had about half of the ear buried inside her but was meeting resistance. I called to him, he pushed harder. Frank! Hey Frank! I rose to a crouch. It was that time of the month for her, she's wearing a tampon. Frank peered at me, then nodded and removed the ear. He curled the string around one finger and tugged. When the little cylinder, swollen and pink, slid out to dangle at the end of the string, a thick ooze of blood followed and soaked darkly into the sofa between her legs. Frank stared at that little pool of blood for a long time, as though mesmerised by it. While he was doing this, Mr. Children went ooh and made as if to stand up. He wasn't trying to escape. It was more like he'd suddenly reawakened to the pain where his ears and nose had been. Frank snapped out of his reverie and turned to him. Still dangling the tampon from his right hand and holding the ear in his left, he took the man in his arms as if embracing a lover and broke his neck. I heard a dry crack, like a dead branch breaking, and with his head twisted at the now familiar angle, Mr. Children plopped back down on the sofa. It was murder with all the drama of picking up a fallen hat and replacing it on a rack. Frank looked at me, dropped the tampon and retrieved the knife. He wore a petulant expression as he stepped toward me, like a small child who's tired of playing. The pointed end of the knife was closing in on my throat when my mobile phone rang. I scrambled to push the blinking green button. Frank hesitated for a moment, then brought the knife closer to my throat. Frank wants to know about this slight like, belief about ringing in these bells to purify spirits and stuff. So we get this little description from Kenji. She wanted to find out about the gods of this country, but she couldn't find any books on the subject in Spanish, and she doesn't read English, so she asked a lot of her customers. But apparently none of the Japanese knew anything, which made her wonder if people here never came up against the kind of suffering where you can't do anything but turn to your god for help. The person who told her about the salvation bells was a Lebanese journalist who'd been here for over 30 years. He told her there was no figure like Christ or Muhammad in Japan, or any god like the kind Westerners imagine, but that certain big rocks and trees and things were decorated with straw ropes and worshipped as gods, and that people also worshipped the spirits of their ancestors. And he said she was absolutely right, that the Japanese had never experienced having their land taken over by another ethnic group, or being slaughtered or driven out as refugees. Because even in World War II, the battlefields were mostly in China and Southeast Asia, and the islands of the Pacific. And then Okinawa, of course. But on the mainland, there were only air raids and the big bombs, so the people at home never came face to face with an enemy who killed and raped their relatives, and forced them all to speak a new language. A history of being invaded and assimilated is the one thing most countries in Europe and the New World have in common, so it's like a basis for international understanding. But people in this country don't know how to relate to outsiders because they haven't had any real contact with them. That's why they're so insular. According to the Lebanese man, Japan's just about the only country in the world that's been untouched, except for the US. But he said of course there's a bright side to that too, and started telling her about the bells, saying that precisely because the Japanese have never experienced a real invasion, there's a certain gentleness here you can't find in other countries, and that they've come up with these incredible methods of healing, like the bells. Ringing them at temples on New Year's Eve is a custom that goes back more than a thousand years, right? How many times was it they rang the salvation bells? It was a funny number, but I forget what it was. A hundred and something, I think. Kenji, do you know how many times they ring them? And it does. And he ends up kind of giving some more information on that. And um, here's some more from Frank. He says, Meanwhile, here's this Peruvian hooker who knows all kinds of fascinating things about Japanese history. For example, from way back, thousands of years ago, the Japanese just focused on growing rice. And even when things started coming in from overseas, like the taiko drum and metals from Persia, the rice farming traditions didn't change. But as soon as the Portuguese brought rifles, everything changed. And the Japanese started having wars all the time. Previously, they'd only fought with swords. I've seen that in movies. It looks like ballet almost. But warfare with guns increased year by year, and the Japanese started invading other countries. And because they hadn't had much experience with foreigners, they were incompetent at occupying a country or relating to its citizens. So people in the neighboring countries grew to hate them. This misguided sort of warfare continued right up until the A-bombs fell. And then after that, Japan changed its way of thinking and gave up war and started making electric appliances and became an economic superpower. So obviously that was the path the country should have followed all along. They lost the war, but it was a war over vested interest in China and Southeast Asia. So now, after all these years, you might say Japan won it after all. 
But why do they ring the bells 108 times, Kenji? Can you tell me? She only had a rough idea. So Kenji calls his girlfriend and he wants to know about, about a bridge because they were going to go and watch the, uh, listen to the tolling of the bells from this bridge. And um, we get, what was the name of that bridge, I said. What bridge? She was pissed off all right when I'd cancelled our plan for Christmas dinner at a fancy hotel because I had to work. She was furious and said something to the effect that the only reason she even bothered to have a boyfriend was so she could spend Christmas with him. Christmas has a special importance for high school girls. John and her friends don't really need guys, boyfriends I mean. I've often heard them say that boyfriends are more trouble than they're worth, that most boys don't have anything interesting to say, or any money either. And in fact, John had spent more time with her friends during the past summer going to the beach and whatnot than with me. But Christmas is a special ritual with them, the one precious night of the year to spend some real quality time with a guy. I had denied her that, and now I was saying I'd be with Frank on New Year's Eve. I couldn't blame her for being angry. And now uh, Frank talks about what it's like to get lost when you're a child. He says, On this particular day, I'd ventured into the unknown beyond the blue mailbox. When you're a kid, getting lost isn't just an event or a situation. It's like a career move. You get this thrill of anxiety and fear and a feeling that you've done something that can never be undone. My sense of myself, of my body, would become very shaky and I'd feel like I was going to melt into the grey fog all around me. A lot of times I'd start screaming. But adults never pay any attention to a little kid alone on the street just screaming. Crying maybe, but not screaming. On this day I was mostly just afraid, but still really excited. And then Mama appeared. All of a sudden she pulled up beside me in the car and said, Goodness, it's my little boy. I started bawling, not because I was happy or relieved to see her, but because I was scared. I felt like Mama had merged with the unknown and must therefore be a completely different person. I thought I somehow had to find a way back to the world I knew, and when Mama went to take me in her arms, I shook her off and tried to run away. I wasn't supposed to meet up with Mama here. I was only supposed to see her back in the real world, and so this woman couldn't be my real Mama even though she looked just like her. So when she grabbed me again, I bit her on the wrist, so hard that my jaw went numb. I didn't think I had any choice. I didn't know what else to do. Mama was yelling her head off. I guess I bit right through the skin where there was an artery or something because blood started gushing out into my mouth, lots of it, and I was biting so hard I couldn't breathe, so I gulped it all down, like a baby nursing at its mother's breast, just sucking up the blood. I felt like I had to, like if I didn't drink it all up, I'd suffocate. And a little bit more of Frank here, and again, this kind of deeper my suspicion that Frank's dead and, and, that, and that Kenji is like seeing him as a figment of his imagination. He says, after I bit Mama that time, my parents took me to a child psychologist and he came to the conclusion that because I hadn't nursed much as a baby, I had a chronic calcium deficiency that made me emotionally unstable and also that the splatter films my older brothers took me to had been a bad influence. They didn't use the term splatter film in those days, but both of my brothers, who were quite a bit older than me, loved horror movies, as about 99% of American kids do. Later, after I killed those two people, the police found a lot of gory film clips and posters and rubber masks and things at our house, and the media decided that was what had made me do it, the influence of horror movies. They needed a reason why a little kid would commit murder, someone or something to point the finger at, and I think they were relieved when they hit upon horror movies as the culprit. But there's no reason a child commits murder, just as there's no reason a child gets lost. What would it be? Because his parents weren't watching him. That's not a reason, it's just a step in the process. It was almost 4am now, and the cold was getting harder and harder to bear. Frank didn't seem to notice it though. I had my overcoat on, but he was wearing only a thin sweater and corduroy jacket. In two nights with Frank, I'd yet to catch him showing any real sign of being cold. He saw me cupping my hands together and blowing on them for warmth and said, Chilly? I nodded, and to my surprise, he took off his own jacket and tried to drape it over my shoulders. No, you need that, I said, pulling away. Frank told me it was okay, he never got cold, and pushed up his sleeves to show me his wrists. Just as I'd noticed in the Omni I pub, they were ripped with countless suicide scars. I wondered what, if anything, the scars had to do with not getting cold. Well, maybe he's dead. And a quite interesting passage here. People often point out how cruel children can be because they'll torture or kill little animals and insects or smash their own toys. But kids don't do things like that for fun. They do it to release the anxieties of the imagination out into the real world. If they can't bear the thought of torturing or killing bugs, they feel an unconscious urge to actually do it and reassure themselves that the world won't come tumbling down. In my case, I couldn't bear the stress of imagining I might lap up somebody's blood again. So when I was four, I slashed my wrists. That was the first time I'd ever really tried to hurt myself. Everybody flipped out and they took me to a shrink again, but again he just told them not to let me watch horror movies. It's true, I was fond of that sort of movie, but not to the extent my brothers were. Basically, people who love horror movies are people with boring lives. They want to be stimulated and they need to reassure themselves, because when a really scary movie is over, you're reassured to see that you're still alive and the world still exists as it did before. That's the real reason we have horror films. They act as shock absorbers, and if they disappeared altogether it would mean losing one of the few ways we have to ease the anxiety of the imagination. 
and I bet you'd see a big leap in the number of serial killers and mass murderers. After all, anyone stupid enough to get the idea of murdering people from a movie could get the same idea from watching the news, right? Now it's the video games. The video games cause violence. And um, here we get a little bit on <laughs> the operation he was given. Uh, so he says, uh, about 10 years later, when I went to prison as an adult, my oldest brother came to visit and explained about those days. He said they hadn't known how to relate to me or what to talk about. Not because I'd killed people, but because I was so fat I looked like a complete stranger. I first started going without much sleep, just taking naps sometimes, when I was in the mental hospital for the fourth time and they cut out part of my brain. I was 15. In the operation, they open a small hole in your skull and insert an instrument like an ice pick into the white matter and sever the nerve fibres, which usually makes you very quiet and docile. Americans love to mess about with the brain. That's why they're at the forefront of neurosurgery. I was already into black magic by then, and I'd met a lot of people in the hospitals and reform schools who taught me things like how to cut somebody's throat without spraying blood around, and where exactly to slice somebody's Achilles tendon so it'll make a high-pitched twang. Useful stuff like that. And I learned hypnosis too, which came so easily to me I couldn't believe it. I'm not saying I feel fulfilled when I kill people. When it's happening, I often think there must be something else I should be doing. And sometimes I feel like I'm right on the verge of discovering what that something else might be. Because the interesting thing is, when I'm killing, that's when I'm the most focused on life, the most clear-headed. And this is just an example of the horrible things that people do in the name of science. Mental hospitals are interesting places, Frank said. I'll never forget hearing about this experiment they did with cats. They put the cat in a cage that has a button on the floor, and when he steps on the button he gets food, so after a while he learns to do that, press the button when he wants food. And then they take him away and starve him for a while, and then put him back in the same cage with the same button, only this time when he steps on it he gets a shock. Not a big shock, just a mild current, but the result's the same. The cat becomes unbalanced, completely neurotic, and in the end he loses the will to eat, even refuses food when it's offered to him, and starves to death. And then Kenji says, The story of the experiment really spoke to me. First the cat learns something, and it's fun for him because he's rewarded with food, but then they starve him and reward the learned behaviour with pain. Naturally the cat doesn't understand what the hell is going on. I experienced things like that nearly every day when I was a kid. I don't mean big things like my father's death, just ordinary everyday dilemmas and double binds. You can't change the grown up world to suit your idea of how things should be, so you have to learn to press the right buttons, and kids growing up find themselves constantly in situations just like the cats. There's no consistency to the way your parents and other adults respond to you when you're a kid. It's especially inconsistent in this country because there aren't any solid standard criteria for judging what's important. The grown-ups live only for money and things with established monetary value, like designer goods. The media, TV, newspapers, magazines, radio, whatever, are full of pronouncements by adults that make it clear that all they really want or care about is money and material goods. From politicians and bureaucrats to the lowliest office drudge drinking cheap sake at some outdoor stall, they all show by the way they live that money is the only thing they aspire to. They'll puff themselves up and say money isn't everything, but all you have to do is watch their behaviour to see where their real priorities lie. The weeklies that cater to middle-aged men criticise compensated dating among high school girls, but in the same issue you'll find recommendations for reasonably priced erotic massage parlours and early morning soap lands. They'll denounce the corruption amongst politicians and bureaucrats, but also feature can't-miss stock tips and bargain real estate deals. And they'll do entire photo spreads on success stories, showing us rich people's houses or some assholes standing there in designer clothes and accessories. Pretty much all day long, day in and day out, 365 days a year, children in this country go through what that food or electric shock cat went through. But try to point that out and some old fucker will jump all over you. You kids are spoiled rotten, how dare you complain when you've never lacked for anything in your life? Why, my generation lived on potatoes and worked our fingers to the bone to make this the wealthy country it is. It's always precisely the sort of smug old wanky you would never, ever want to end up like. We don't live the way you tell us to because we're afraid that if we do, we'll grow up to be like you. And the thought of that is unbearable. It's all right for you because you'll be dead soon anyway. But we still got another 50 or 60 years to live in this stinking country. And that reminds me of that meme going around where it's like, when people complain, oh, you kids don't know how easy you've got it. And it's like, well, shouldn't we be trying to make life easier for our kids? Why be jealous of the next generation because they live easier lives than us? Surely that's the point. Just this is where we get the title of the book from. He's, uh, so he's, Frank says, there's just one thing I was hoping we could do that we never got around to. I wanted to have some miso soup with you, but it's too late now. We won't be meeting again. Miso soup. Yeah, I'm really interested in miso soup. I ordered it at a little sushi bar in Colorado once long ago, and I thought it was a darn peculiar kind of soup. The smell it had and everything, so I didn't eat it, but it intrigued me. It had that funny brown colour and smelled kind of like human sweat, but it also looked delicate and refined somehow. I came to this country hoping to find out what the people who eat that soup on a daily basis might be like. 
So I'm a little disappointed we didn't get to have some together. I asked him if he was going back to America right away. No, not right away, he said. So I suggested we could still have miso soup together sometime. Even the smallest Japanese restaurant has it, I explained. And you can even buy it in convenience stores. That's all right, Frank said with a smile. That peculiar smile of his which looked as if his features weren't relaxing but collapsing. I don't need to eat the stuff now because I'm here, right in the middle of it. The soup I ordered in Colorado had all these little slices of vegetables and things, which at the time just looked like kitchen scrapings to me. But now I'm in the miso soup myself, just like those bits of vegetable. I'm floating around in this giant bowl of it and that's good enough for me. So now we know where the, the uh, title of the story comes from. Uh, I will say my theory that Frank doesn't exist doesn't necessarily hold up because um, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? Kenji. His girlfriend sees Frank and he's also in some pictures. And like at the end, I would have, you could have really easily made it like clarified because it says, I opened the envelope beneath the street lamp. It was sealed with seven of the little print club photo stickers of Frank and me. Me before I knew anything, standing there looking disgruntled and Frank beside me with his poker face. And I'm just like, you know, you could have just had just him in those photos. And then it would have been this big twist at the end, like in one of the last uh, sentences. But um, I think uh, Murakami, Murakami tries to make it more um, up to your interpretation. I mean, I still interpret it that Frank didn't exist. But I guess you could argue either way, you know. So I actually, right at the end, I think the fact that it didn't clarify it has meant that this one's going to sit in my head for a while now and it's going to like prey on me. So uh, I was going to give it a 4 out of 5 but that last page I, I think really pushed it up to a 4.5 although I only just did enjoy it. It would probably be in my top 10 of the quarter although it's not going to be my top of the quarter I don't think. And I would recommend especially if you've enjoyed some of the excerpts I've read although as I say it's not for the faint of heart. So there we have it, that's what I made of In The Miso Soup by Ryu Murakami. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.